You are in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Donica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Donica. Now, what's very interesting is every episode for the past year and a half since the pandemic began, I've begun by asking my guests, so how's your pandemic going? And today, that's actually the whole theme of our episode, because our next guest, Sherry Wallach, uh, really had a lousy pandemic in the beginning. And she's going to tell us what happened, how she turned it around, how she made lemonade out of lemons or holla out of hell, and how she decided to write a book called From Hell to Holla, which I happen to hear, uh, have here and I highly endorse and I love it. And I'm going to let you tell, I'm going to let her tell you all about how she became an accidental entrepreneur. I love that. Uh, uh, that moniker, and started an amazing company by the sea. So with no further ado, welcome Sherry. You're in the ladies room. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. I spend a lot of time in the ladies room, like literally at 57, who doesn't? You know? <laughs> and we want to hear all your ladies room stories from the road. Um, usually I ask our guests, you know, to start off by telling us how your pandemic's going. And I guess on a scale of one to 10, you probably had a really interesting time. Well, I, it was hard because I, I own this company called By the Sea and we sell cruises and all-inclusive resorts to corporations. And we do something called incentive travel. And when the pandemic started and actually when March 12th hit and all of the ships stopped sailing, uh, my heart sank because this was my baby. I started this company 18 years ago and it became uh, unfortunately it became too much of me so my identity started to just disappear i forgot that i had two kids i forgot that i you know have other things in my life and i just felt like somebody killed my child and um it was really hard and i'm somebody who suffers from generalized anxiety disorder um i always say what you doesn't we all have a little it's anxiety. a spectrum it's <laughs> It's like a lot of things like asthma. Uh, yeah, asthma. We all have, we, we have, we're, we're hypochondriacs. But for me, I have, maybe it's just terrible coping skills. Maybe it's just, I, I, I can't handle um, horrible disappointment. I don't know. I'm a pretty rough and tumble girl and I take on everything. I, I'm fearless about a lot of things, but when this happened, I just crashed and burned and I started like grabbing pills out of the cabinet and I just didn't, My the worst part of my day was the morning because I thought, oh my God, I have to get up and fill like at least 12 to 17 hours of something. And I had nothing other than depressing phone calls from clients canceling programs, cruise lines not wanting to give me money back. It, it was just, and, and staff that I was trying to keep. So you know, how, many, people, how many employees do you have? So in total, there are six of us, and most of us have children. Um, most of us have, you know, payments to make and lives to support. And you're and a I single mean, mother like, of two fabulous children. Uh, yeah, I, well, yeah. I so mean, we're I, out of the nest, and I heard, uh, because I have read the book, um, they came home. Um, and we're, I'm actually starting a support group of mothers whose adult children came home during the I would need one of those, like seriously, because we don't know how to be the mothers of adults and they don't know how to be the, the, the adult children of parents. And it's, it's, it's hard. And they so regress when they come home. And I even notice this when I go to my mother's house, I'm the oldest of six children and we all regress to where we, you know, like sort of the emotional stage we were at the last time we were living together, which was a really right. long time ago. Well, on top of that, I had a, you know, a, a depressed daughter, a, a son who didn't know what he was going to do, who was still at the time, still in school at Northwestern and graduating in June. And it was March and at school just literally shut down, go home, don't come back. 
he didn't even get a chance to say goodbye. And the worst thing, and you know, because your daughter does theater, my son had worked the entire time that he was at Northwestern to get this showcase that is their thing to showcase their talents to the New York you know, talent management scene. And it just was gone. I mean, he didn't get to do his thing. So that was really hard for him. So he was, he was hurt and he was lost. My daughter was depressed because she got out of school and she didn't have a job. Also went to Northwestern and was trying to find herself. And it was like, so I had them, I had my own depressed stuff. And I had an ex-husband who had just had a massive widow maker heart attack that didn't make anybody a widow, but it made him very, very ill. And I, and it was like, I had him in the house and I, and his brother was in the house and this is my ex-husband, right? But we're really good friends. So here he is. And yeah, you're a much better woman than I am. <laughs> we never get rid of ex-husbands. Okay. But I was just, I was just cracking up and losing, just losing it. And all I did was cry and literally cry, throw up, take pills, cry some more, didn't eat. It was even the psychologist and the psychiatrist, they were like, all right, so there's nothing really wrong with you. And you're not, you know, you're not bipolar, but all right, here's some Lexapro. Here's some, here's some Xanax. Here's some sleeping pills. Like, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. And it took its toll on me. And one night after feeling attacked by my kids and it wasn't their intention, it really wasn't. I just had had enough of, of everything. It wasn't one specific thing. It just boiled over. And I told my girlfriend, that I, in, a, in a fit of crying, I, I, I really want to die. I just want to die. I don't want to be here anymore. I've had enough. I don't want to see how this plays out. I just, I just want to die. And I had taken a bag of pills into my room and shut the door and she thought, oh my God, she, you know, I can't get her on the phone and she killed herself, which I'm too afraid. I'm, I'm too afraid that I would live is the problem. <laughs> I would take the pills and I'd be the one who lives, you know? So, um, after this hysteria, she called her ex-husband, who happens to be uh, a sergeant, right? And she called him- Police sergeant. What? In the police, not in the military. Right, no, 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 right. She's a, he's a, right, Broward Sheriff's Office. And he, um, you know, she said, what do I do? And he said, do you want me to come over? And she said, no, no, just don't come over. And he said, you know what? I'll just send the plantation police to come and check on her, which is not what happens in these situations. They come and check on you. And if you have said you're gonna hurt yourself, it doesn't matter what you say. And I did the whole, I, I, I didn't mean it. I was just stressed out. I had a meltdown, I'm fine. And that doesn't help. You end up Baker acted in the nut house for like seven right, so years. Explain to people what the Baker Act is. Uh, the Baker Act is if you appear to be a harm to yourself or anyone else, they have the right to basically lock you up in either a hospital or a mental institution for 72 hours. If, if they really made a mistake and you're really fine, they'll let you out before that, but typically no, because they don't want the liability. But if you appear not to be okay after the 72 hours, they can make you, they can keep you as long as they want to keep you. And then you have to go to court to get yourself out. And this, so, is, this is a federal law. This is it's, not it's a Florida law. I'm not sure because Baker Act is a Florida thing, but it exists in other Both places. Both have it. You know, it's um, it's scary because suddenly, as you'll see in the book, I realized that um, white privilege, which is really kind of a disgusting thing anyway, does not help you in the nut house. You are stripped of everything, your rights, your possessions. They stripped me of my bra. I mean, I'm like, my bra? They said, well, you could hang yourself. I'm like, come on, people. But, you know, and I kept saying, I'm not crazy. No, really, I'm, I'm, I'm not crazy. And they said, well- But if you take my bra, I'm gonna be crazy. I, if you take my freaking bra, and I only have 36 Bs here, baby, so <laughs> I don't even really need the bra. But the and, they took your, is, and they probably took your phone. They took my phone, my bra. They took my toothpaste because they said I could cut myself with the metal on the toothpaste. I, they took everything. They stripped me of everything. And the funny thing is they let me make phone calls. But you know, years ago, you remembered phone numbers. I don't know anybody's phone numbers. So the only person I could really call was my mother <laughs> because I knew her phone number, but I'm like, oh my God, I, I, I don't even know my brother's number. I don't know my kids' numbers. I don't know what I'm doing here. You know, but I remembered slowly, I was like, okay, I think I know one of my kids' numbers, but you have nothing, right? And, and, and like, I amused myself on the phone, right? I had nothing. So I just sat there uh, until they yeah, decided- it's like the modern day pacifier. What, say it again? phone is like the modern day pacifier yeah, the phone yeah and and you know but i did realize after being for 72 hours in a hospital 
I gave up the phone and I found clever ways to amuse myself. So actually it was wonderful to not have it because I, after I was hysterical and conv tried to convince them I wasn't crazy and they said, well, the, the, the more you tell us you're not crazy, you're crazy, the crazier you sound. And I'm like, oh, that does sound like, I'm not crazy, I swear I'm not crazy. You sound like a nut. So um, fortunately I had somebody on the inside who was really helpful and she said to me, she sat me down and said, Shari, your job is to appear as sane as possible and do not complain, don't throw yourself around, do not demand anything, just get through the process, you will get out of here, you'll be fine, but you have to appear truly in control. So the other people weren't, you know, there were a lot of really sick people in there and I was like, all right, you know, I'm gonna do this because this is my business. I'm gonna pretend I am on a site inspection of a seriously bad hotel. And I got, they gave me a little tiny golf pencil and, a, and like a piece of paper and I'm like writing down everything that's wrong with the place. Like ants here, roaches here. Okay, this doesn't look <laughs> right. But, you know, I, I started like critic, you know, like critiquing everything. Did you do a Yelp review? I, I did not, I do not think the mental hospital is actually on Yelp, but it should be. But I did write a letter to the, um, to the president of the hospital group. And okay, so some good things came out of it. Number one, they did not charge me my copay. Oh, wow. You know, hey, I've never hey, heard of that. Right. So they didn't charge me the copay and um, they heard me and they did remove a few of the really bad um, healthcare workers from the unit because they did not belong there. They were dreadful. I mean, the one that I remember was like a scene out of Orange is the New Black or Wentworth. This woman was so bizarre. And I would say, I forget her actual name and I don't even remember what I called her in the book, but I changed her name. And I would say, hi, how are you? And she would say something about, I'm blessed and always in favor. And I, but with a really, with a real sharp edge. And I thought, oh, and this was the woman who came every night. They have to come into your room and like click a button so that they can prove that they've done their rounds. So every 15 minutes you are monitored. Mm. I mean, you're completely monitored. They, they check you, they make sure you're in your room, asleep or whatever. It, it, I mean, it was, I feel for people. I really, really do. Cause it's scary and I'm sane and it was scary. I can't imagine if you're really ill and you're in a place like that, horrible. It can so. push you over the edge. So let's just take it back a step and, and explain to people. Uh, I think we kind of glossed over this. Um, your business was 100% travel based. Yeah. So with the pandemic, not only did your business crash, but you were actually having to give refunds to people and oh. enable refunds. Uh, yeah. So it was actually negative. Were you able to get the small business loans to kind of stay afloat? Well, the small business loan didn't help me refunding money. The small business loan just kept me paying my, my staff. I couldn't pay my sales staff because they're 1099. I have, um, and I have three people who actually are employed by me, plus, well, I didn't get any money from, yeah, I did, I did. I got paid on the PPP and I had my kids working for me for a little bit, so they got a little PPP, but I mean, it amounted to, the first PPP loan was $65,000, which you use up in 10 minutes. The second PPP loan was $87,000, which we just kind of finished using. So it helped, but you know, it, it, it doesn't, it, it only pays salaries. I mean, it'll pay your rent, but I own my office space and I don't have a mortgage on it, so I didn't have that. It pays your phone bill. Okay, how many phone calls were we making? But it did help. The key was though, convincing the cruise lines to refund the money to the clients. And I will say this, in all of it, I didn't have one angry client in the end. They all either got their money back, got 125% future cruise credit with the money they let the cruise lines keep, got, you know, they, they got stuff. So no, but we, we did not, I to say screw over. We screwed over nobody. We protected all of our clients and we a lot of times paid them back before we got the money back from the cruise line. So our, our squeaky clean reputation, which we've always had is still really great and our clients are still there. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, that's, that's fabulous. But here's, here was the real problem. So we lost all of our 2020 with exception of a few programs that had, had traveled earlier in the year, but the rest of the year was gone. And we had a few early 2021, I had like one or two programs that traveled. The challenge was all of the people who booked 2020 and 21 moved their programs to 22, 23. And if they had booked 
like let's just say that their 20 program wasn't with me and it was a land program in Hawaii, but they were booking a 21 or a 22 cruise with me, I couldn't get that business anymore because they moved their 20 in another slot. So I got bumped out of having that business in 21 or even in 22. Like I had a client who had South Africa booked for one year and a program in Rome booked for one year and our Tahiti charter was supposed to be in 20. So that program's now in 24. Hey. So we as a business don't get paid until the program travels. So 21, we're getting paid next to nothing. 20, we only got the business from the earlier part of the year. 22, we're slowly coming back and our real opportunities are 23, 24. Fortunately, my business has no debt, you know, and we weren't a new business. We were a very stable business and I have some killer clients. I mean, they are any opportunity they had to give us something they did. So they were really good about it, but it's scary. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be really scary if my kids were still in college and I was paying off loans and, and, you know, just at the beginning of my career, but I'm, you know, I'm not. So for me, it, it was okay, but I still felt sick to my stomach about it. I, you know, I still felt that way because I felt anxious and, and, and afraid and scared for the future and, you know, without purpose and without identity because this, this business was my identity. So that was really it more than anything else. Yeah, I think that's one of the things people have to understand about the pandemic is there were lots of people whose businesses decreased or took a hit. There were many businesses that actually increased uh, during the pandemic. Um, there were lots of people who could work from home, but then there were people like yourself that business went from okay on March 11th to stopped on March 12th. Uh, yeah. My daughter you mentioned is an actress. She was playing Lauren in Kinky Boots on March 11th and March 12th her entire profession was shut down. Um, right. And that does really, really, I mean, certainly there's financial implications, but there's huge identity issues. It's the psyche. Identity issues. It's the psyche more than anything else. I, I will tell you some of the businesses that I work with had their best years ever. One of my clients um, makes candle warmers. You know, you plug them in and they, and they heat up and then you smell the fragrance. Well, like what a great business in a pandemic because you want your house to smell good. You're sitting in your pajamas. I mean, if you sell pajamas, you had a great year. If you sell candles or candle warmers. If you sell, or, if you sell pajama tops. Pajama <laughs> tops, right. And I, just, and I want to say to you, I mean, I feel really awkward here because, you know, you have a degree in gynecology and stuff. And I've got a cup on. I really want to be naked from the bottom down. But I won't do it. I, I have that effect I, on people. I, yeah, I, oh, you know what? Every time I see you, I want to say, Danica, I want to be naked from the bottom down. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we didn't tell people how we know each other. I we? love this story. And I have to tell you, I love, love, love that the forward of your book is written by Adam Goldstein, who is the previous uh, president and CEO of Royal Caribbean International and an old, old, old friend of mine uh, from college days. And that is not only how we know each other, but I love, love, love the fact that in the forward, he tells the story that happened five minutes before we met each other. Um, and he talks about how the two of you had this bonding experience on an airplane and really got to know each other on more of a personal level than a professional level. And Adam, one of his questions that he loves to ask everybody is about camp or their camp experience. And you had said you were going to visit your son at camp. And he just nicely said, which camp? And when you said Frenchwoods, we'll give a shout out to Frenchwoods. He said, oh, my friend Denica's daughter goes to Frenchwoods. Yeah, do you know Denica Moore? And I'm like, I, you know, is her daughter Jana Bernard? <laughs> He's like, yeah. I said, I, yes, I know who that is. I know who that is. And I, I remember like telling you, oh my God, I know, you know, Adam Goldstein. And it's just, it was a weird, it was just a weird thing. I, I really believe my rabbi always says to me, oh, now I gave away that I'm a Jew. Well, you know You that. gave that Jews away a long time ago when you started right at the beginning, when you said about your generalized anxiety disorder and blame I have your memory. <laughs> I have, I remember nothing, but, um, and now I just forgot what I was. Something about the rabbi. The, oh, rabbi. the rabbi. My rabbi, Rabbi Andrew Jacobs, who I. Are you there? I'm losing you. Hello. Hello. Okay, we lost you for a second. Hello. We lost um, you for a minute. Yeah, I'm here. Are you there? I'm here. We're here. So I, Rabbi Andrew always says there are no coincidences. And like one of the things in the book, like there's no coincidence that we met 
one of the things I said about- the people who aren't religious, Ayn Rand also said that. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't believe there are because I, when I set out on this journey that we will talk about, um, I was gonna be gone for 10 days to visit my brother. Like I was not gonna go on this 95 day journey and I didn't count the number of days and I didn't count the number of stops. And without intention, I went to 18 different places. Well, and I'm I stopped. I'm offended that you didn't was, come to New Jersey and see us. I was in New Jersey at the very, see New Jersey was the first stop, but I was so fucked up at that point, you didn't want to see me. I was just not in my right head. So when I started in New Jersey, it was like, I needed, I, that was my, my like stepping off ground or whatever to go and do the rest of the tour. And then I never came back this way. I just kind of kept going, but um, yeah, thank God for my brother. Cause no one was gonna, I, I was convinced no one was gonna let me in their house in a pandemic. Like why would they? Mm -hmm. But even my brother was like, okay, we have to wear masks and you have to be careful. He goes, but I understand. Cause he had spoken to me in the mental hospital. And he was like, I gotta get you. And he tried to get me out of there and he couldn't. And he's like, all right, come here. Cause I knew that if getting I stayed- released after the 72 hour hold or did you stay longer? So, no, so after 72 hours, my kids came and picked me up. They were trying to get me out, but there's no way you're getting out. Like no matter what you say. So they came and they met me. And I remember the thing that I did first, I went home, I took a shower. The next day I gathered up every single thing in my house that I did not need anymore. Blankets, perfume, body, body soap, um, conditioner, games, anything that I thought people on the inside could use. Cause we were given nothing. I mean, like the shampoo was a little thing of like shit body wash. It was gross. My hair looked like Roseanne, Rosanna, Dana, but worse. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I looked disgusting. I, I didn't smell good. I was just miserable. Um, so I donated all that stuff because I felt like that was the right thing to do. And then I called my brother and I said, okay, I got, I have to leave this house because now it's become a trigger and I, I need to go. And he said, okay. So I flew and I just kept going and I kept going and going and people were like, come, sure, come, come. And I, it wasn't like I was going on a cooking tour. I just felt if I'm, if people are going to welcome me into their homes, then I'm going to make myself useful. I don't ever believe I should be somebody's guest. I believe I should be somebody's housemate. And if you're a housemate, you should be cooking and cleaning and watching their kids. And, you know, you should be useful. Nobody Could you just there tell to that to my adult children who were here for the yeah. months and months of, during the pandemic? This is, I've told this to my adult children and they don't get it. But in someone else's house, they'd be really neat in my house. <laughs> but I was really useful. I guess that's why people kind of were happy to have me. And then I started experimenting and I recognized that like I had anxiety, I was taking pills, I was trying to calm myself down. And the minute I got in the kitchen and I had flour and yeast and a, and a recipe, because you can't. Oh, I'm losing you again. I think your internet connection is weak. Um, so the book is called From Hell to Holla, Rising from Fragile to Fearless, One Grain at a Time by Sherry Wellick. Are you back? She's back. While you were gone, I did a commercial for your book again. Okay, good. Every time I leave, I'll just keep leaving. <laughs> Are you doing this on purpose? <laughs> no. Um, every time I got in the kitchen and just, just kind of like yoga. When you're doing yoga and they say, do this pose, do down dog, do kung fu warrior or whatever, you're focusing on how to get yourself in that pose and how to stay in that pose, right? And that's why it's a good anxiety reliever. The same thing with baking and gardening and knitting and playing music, same concept. When you're doing something, your brain, there is no multitasking, it's a fallacy. When your brain is focusing on actually doing something, you're not thinking about the other thing. So if I had a really bad morning full of anxiety, I'd get on this call with you and I'd be very calm because I'm not thinking about all the crap that's bothering me. Same with baking. I just have that influence on people. What? I just have that calming influence on people. It's it's partly I love you, but it's partly <laughs> like focus on something else. Change the channel in your brain. That's what it is. That's what anxiety is. You're anxious or you're worried or you're focusing on something that you can do nothing about. I read something recently that worrying, one of them is the future and one is the past. But if you're if you stay in the present, and you do something right now, whatever it is, writing, baking, gardening, playing the ukulele, it's hard to be anxious. So well, that my favorite quote is from uh, Mark Twain, 
who said, I've lived through many horrible experiences in my life, most of which never happened. Well, that's it. Like, you know what you're supposed to ask yourself? In any situation, what is the worst that could possibly happen to you? And can you handle it? Mm -hmm. And whenever I do something, I ask myself that question. What's the likelihood of something really horrible happening? And if it did happen, can I handle it? You know, can I? Did you see the movie about the guy? It's a guy who has a very small amygdala and he climbs up a mountain. He climbs up mountains like scary, scary shit. He, he does stuff that you should never do because he doesn't have that fear factor. Mm -hmm. And when I started to realize that fear is just a wasted emotion or a wasted- well, fear also can be very useful because fear really in normal people would tell you not to climb up a scary mountain. <laughs> but I'm not a normal person. And I find that fear is paralyzing mm -hmm. and you end up so afraid of what will never happen. If you, I'm not talking about mountain climbing and, and, and drag racing. I'm talking about living your life and saying like, look, here's this book, right? Some people said to me, you're going to write a book. I mean, really, you're going to sell any copies? I mean, and started to talk me out of it. Some people said, what do you got to lose? And I thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? Nobody buys my book? No, the worst that happens is so many people buy my book that they run out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the worst. But actually, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's an agent, a, a publishing agent. And what she said, she's never been busier than during the pandemic. Right. Because everybody decided it was time to write a book, first of all, everybody who didn't have time to write a book before, but yeah. also people were reading again. And right. so people were reading books. I personally was listening to books, most of them. So yeah, well, can you get when's, this your audio, audio? when's your audio book coming out? I want somebody to take it. I went to Audible. Well, I have a great narrator for you. If, if you I know, it. you know what? I know the problem isn't getting the narrator. The problem is that my publisher has pitched it to several companies that do audiobooks, and so far, I think they have to wait until they see that it's really popular, and then they go, "All right." All right. I so I want everybody in their Amazon review. Everybody get the book, write your Amazon review, and what I'm going to add to my Amazon review is great book, but I really wish there was an audio book. There you go. Yeah, because there I have much. I, what I discovered during the pandemic is I have much more time to listen to books than to sit down and read. So when I was, I've never done as much housework as I did during the pandemic, oh. um, because I had so many people living in the house, most of whom weren't helping. Uh, and, and most of them were making a mess. Um, but also I am privileged enough to have a housekeeper under normal circumstances who was not working during the pandemic. Uh -huh. So, you know, that was also a, a major uh, challenge for me. But while I was doing housework, I was listening to audiobooks. And of course, you know what else you could listen to is my podcast. Um, I, so there's been several episodes of the podcast dealing with pandemic anxiety. Uh, one with psychiatrist, Dr. Jesse Gold, who talked about generalized anxiety and generalized pandemic anxiety on top of that. We also talked to Dr. Una McCann, who's a psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins, about what she saw in people with PTSD. Uh, and she actually, as a psychiatrist, was redeployed to working into the, in the emergency room there because they had so many people with psych emergency visits right. that they put her there like full time, a couple of times a week, just to mm -hmm. help process and screen and triage people. Um, so we talked about that. Um, I think the quote you were looking for before about anxiety and what bothers, it borrows from the future is that anxiety is obsessing about the future. Depression is obsessing about the past. Yes. That's it. And yes. in doing either of those things, you're missing the gift, which is the present or the present. Well, the gift, gift they, they, call it, they call it a gift because it, you know, they call the present a gift because it is a, it's a present, whatever. You know what I'm yeah. talking about. I mean, yeah. it that is. That whole thing. That it's, whole thing. It's a gift. It implies that it's under your control. And normal anxiety is generally something we can say, okay, I'm going to take a break. And generalized anxiety disorder is not under your control. But you found solace in the kitchen. And what I first want to know is was this a new thing that you did during the pandemic, or were you always a great cook and a collar baker? Well, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself a great cook. I think because if it's got more than six ingredients, like I'm out. But, and any Part of being a great cook is picking the right recipe. <laughs> that's right. So any, anybody can make anything in my book because if I can make it, Trust so me. how many ingredients in your typical basic challah? 
Well, let's see. If there's, it's, it's water, yeast, salt, bread, bread flour is the key. Bread, there's two keys to halal, we'll talk. So water, warm water, fl um, yeast, bread flour, salt, sugar. Sugar, there's five ingredients, right? Am I missing one? Sugar, uh, well, salt, Unless you get bread fancy, bread. the sesame yeah. seeds on top. Tell people That's what challah is for the 14 people who are listening who don't know what challah is or what the what the challah we're talking about. So challah is, oh, eggs. Oh, sorry. See, there you go, eggs. That's the sixth ingredient, there's six. So the eggs are what make challah different than any other bread. It's an egg bread. So it's not, you know, there's nothing so special about it except it does have eggs in it. Um, and it's the braiding of the bread that makes it a real challah. And if it has 12 humps to it, or 12, you know, when you braid it, there's 12 humps. Um, that's the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's a significant bread to Jewish people. Um, there are other, like 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 um, Greek Easter bread is similar. There are other breads that are similar to this, but what makes this so special is the braiding. And then you egg wash it on the top and it's shiny. So you've seen it, the yellow bread that you see in, the, in, in Publix or whatever supermarket, you know, that you see. Um, what it makes mine different is that I throw in weird ingredients. Like the people the people who eat my challah, they love the chocolate challah mm. because I infuse chocolate into it when it's rising and it's like it's like babka, but not as fattening. I make challah with nuts and raisins and sun-dried tomatoes and seeds and lavender and, you know, like, like uh, cranberries and white chocolate. And I can do anything. Mm -hmm. So it, it has to be a dry ingredient because if you put a wet ingredient in it, you just kill it. So any dry ingredient, you come up with your own creations, and a lot of them are in the book of what I came up with because I was bored. Then I started dyeing it different colors, and I made tie dye bread and and just just weird stuff. And rainbow bread. Did you make rainbow bread for Pride Month? I made rainbow bread, but I call it acceptance bread <laughs> because I think it's about all people, not just gay people. I think it's you should accept everybody for who they are and love them, and it's that's why I call it acceptance bread. Um, well, it's about it's about gay people, LGBTQI people. It's also about allies and it's also about right. people who are supporting. So, you know, tell me that story. How did you go from being married to a man? Although I actually recently heard you were married to two men. We're not at the same time. Not, not at the same, same time. time. So you went, you were married to two different men and then fell in love with a woman. Tell us yeah. that story. Okay, I'll tell, I'll tell you the whole story, the real story, the true story is um so i met this woman when i was pregnant and um for the first time or second time the first no the, the first husband was french we were married for four years you know they say french are great lovers don't believe that well maybe some of them are this one <laughs> so and that wasn't why he just you know wasn't my cup of tea but we got it was fine we met at club med when i was really young and he was, you know, we had a good time, got married. And then um, divorced him and met Michael, who really was the right guy at the right time for me. He's 10 years older, came from a really traditional Jewish family. I wanted Jewish children. I wanted that life. And um, he gave that to me. And, you know, there were things that, I, I, Michael, I love Michael. He is, to this day, such a great friend. He, we always joke that he's the president of the Shari Wallach fan club. And I wrote in his book, I hope to God one day there's another member. <laughs> so, you know, and he's, he's still one of my best friends. I, I love him. I love that he's the dad of my kids and I love him as a friend. Um, and it just, there was something missing. And I think for me, I, not that I always knew this about myself, but you know, today you can be queer and you can be on the spectrum and you can like boys and girls. My kids are all, you know, like they're like, I'm queer, I'm this, I'm that. I like boys, I like girls and all their friends you know, kind of like, yeah, that's cool. And they support each other and people, re you know, the woman in the bookstore downstairs has an I'm queer, you know, little, pe I'm like, people announced this. Like when I was a kid, you didn't even talk about it and you denied it. Like, oh, so or it was an insult. It's an insult. Like I, I'm not gay, you know, like whatever I knew it is. one person in college, I knew nobody in high school. I knew nobody in high school. And who it was like, was ew, like, gay. Ew, that's disgusting. And I knew one person in college who was out. That's it. I didn't know anybody in high school and in college. I don't even, I, I knew some theater majors that we kind of suspected, you know, but yeah. We didn't have theater majors in my college. 
All right, so you went to Princeton, I went to <laughs> Delphi. We had theater majors. I majored in communications, but I was almost a theater major. Funny, you want trivia? I went to school with Jonathan Larson, the guy who wrote Rent. Wow. And another th another trivia, you know Gary Delabate or Delabate? I don't. Howard Stern Show? I don't. Yeah, you know, well, he's like Boy Gary. He, if you watch the Howard Stern Show. You know anyway. for sure I have never watched the Howard Stern Show in my okay. entire life, right? You're, you're, you're missing <laughs> out. But anyway, so Gary and I also went to school together. So there were a few like celebs who came, became celebs. So I wasn't And you have, a, you have celebs who wrote the um, book quotes on the back of your book. One of whom, fun we, fact, we, let's we, talk yeah. about Small World. Um, one of the pe celebrities who wrote a book quote on the back of your book is John Cryer, uh, who's the actor of the star of Two and a Half Men. Uh, but the more important thing about John Cryer is that his cousin-in-law is Donna Cryer, who has been a guest on this show. Stop it. And she's the CEO and founder of the Global Liver Institute. Oh. Yeah, awesome, fabulous person. Well, John Cryer and I went to sleepaway theater camp together. Little plug for Stage Door Manor, even though our children went you to French You don't allow work. Stage Door Manor plugs on this show. I am so sorry. But I went. We, we only do Frenchwood's plugs. I went to SDM um, with Johnny and also with David Quinn, who's on the back as well. And it was, it was a great experience. I really got to find myself there because I was a very lost kid. But going back to the how I ended up with a woman question, because I we're gonna we have to answer this question. The thing is, I always liked girls. Like I was in theater and I loved, like, I just loved them. And there was this one girl I used to follow home from school and she was starring in a show. I was in seventh grade, she was in 12th grade. Ooh. And I used to ride my bike and follow her home because I had this big girl crush. But you know, yeah, I dated boys and married too, obviously, and and you know, I had boyfriends all over the place when I could get dates. And, <laughs> I never looked at it as, I, could I be attracted to a woman? I didn't understand that. Or was it allowed? Could you do that? And so I have this friend, and we became really good friends and traveling companions. And she just got me. I, I, she just got me. She understood my New York sense of humor because she's also from New York. And we both had children. And you know, so one day, we're on this cruise. And a, a mutual friend, well, no, a friend of mine who, was, who became a mutual friend in the cruise industry you know, asked me who this girl was. And I'm like, she's my friend. Like, oh, so she happened to be gay, this friend. And she's like, ah, she goes, what's your real relationship with her? I said, what are you recruiting? <laughs> she goes, I, I saw the way she looked at you. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? She goes, I think she loves you. And I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. I mean, do I get a toaster if I convert? I mean, like, what is that? Do you think everybody is gay? She goes, no, but I think you might have a little bit of it in you. I'm like, you know what? I think maybe everyone has a little bit of it in them. I mean, come on, I have friends that are gay and I used to say to them, if you take the sex part out of it, I'd rather hang out with women. Like, and that's fair. I love my women friends. I don't have a lot of male friends. The ones I do have are either gay or like they're really close friends and I just adore them, but I don't seek out necessarily straight male friends for the most part because we don't have the female stuff in common, right? Like the shopping, you know, the wine spritzer, I don't know, we just don't, the Cosmo. So anyway, so this other girl said, I think, I think she's in love with you. And I'm like, you're an asshole. I mean, honestly. So later on during the day, we were sitting on the couch and I said, can I ask you something? Are you in love with me? She's like, no. I said, okay. <laughs> Thank God. She goes, no, I love you. You're my closest friend, but no, I'm not in love with you. And I'm like, okay. And so was we, she gay um, or straight at the time? Well, well, she she was married. I was married. We're married to men. Like, you know, married to boys. And the whole week of this cruise, we're on a cruise together. And the whole week I kept looking at her like, is there something there that I'm not seeing? You know, there must be something there that wasn't there before. You know, I'm thinking that... It was my, was this girl right? Like, is there something about me or is it her or what? I don't know. So as we're on this cruise, I remembered that she used to watch all those gay shows like Queer as Folk and The L Word and all that stuff. And I thought, maybe she's gay, you know, like stupid. So I asked her on the cruise, can I ask you, why do you watch all those shows? Like if you're not gay or, you know, why are you watching those things? She goes, I don't know. I just find it really fascinating. I'm like, all right, fair enough. Not that you have to be gay to watch a certain TV oh. show or a certain 
set of TV no, shows or no, but I asked her, I said, Well, would you kiss a girl? Like, would you do that? And she's like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, kissing a girl must be just like kissing a boy, only with less hair. And that's kind of an appealing idea. And we just kind of like, you know, we just talked about it. Like, this is my closest friend because I want to know, like, you know, what do you think? And would you ever do that? And would you be interested in doing that? And who would you do it with if you, I mean, it was just ad nauseum because neither one of us were those college girls who did it in college. Because, you know, you hear about, like I experimented with my roommates and for me, my roommates were like my brothers because I didn't go away to college. So I wasn't experimenting with them. And she didn't either. And it never really occurred to me. And then- I didn't even like most of my roommates, let alone want to make out with them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so then I kind of seven, whatever, five days into this cruise, I got really bold after like three bottles of wine. And I <laughs> said, you know, you could kiss me. And then we never have to do this again. You don't even have to talk about it never do it again we're good let's just get it out of the way that would be great right because then you could fulfill your curiosity of it and i could just put it on my list of things i've done because you know i just do things because i'm pretty fearless in a lot of ways and i just try stuff the problem is when you try something like that be prepared to really like it and never go back and that was the problem i didn't realize that like fireworks were going off and i was like wow i like this and i was really afraid to admit that like it was scary I, you know, I'm the mother of two kids and people know me as Shari Wallach, the wife of this man and the, you know, so you don't just go, hey, guess what? Now I'm gay mom of, you know, so it took a long, long, long time for me and especially her to come to terms with it and to find, find it comfortable. Only the weird thing is I felt, felt it, found it comfortable right away. Like I really felt like there's a different like okay you're a doctor we could talk about this mm -hmm. women touch differently women are very sensual and very it's it's a different thing like it's just different it's not better or worse or whatever it's just different and women touch differently and I was like wow I really like this like and and our engines heat up differently right so I don't know I, I mean I'm not gay okay let's I mean I'm not like a gay 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 person but I and, and if I were on a desert island and it was a choice of nobody or a man, yeah, sure. You know, like, okay, that sounds good. So well, maybe I like what you said to me the first time you told me about this. And I was very curious. And what I loved about talking to you about this is I never had anybody in my life I could just ask these questions to at that point. Yeah. Um, and I had been recently divorced and I found out, from, like all of a sudden, everybody was talking to me about their sex lives. Um, and I found out that five people who I knew uh, in the process of their divorces had decided to change teams. And I was just curious about like, how does that all work? And I loved what you said. You said, I don't see myself as gay. I just see myself as somebody who's in love with a woman. Right. I, I just, I could be, I'm in love with people. Like I find people, I, I will find someone who is a total turn on like I used to talk about Adam all the time, and if he watches this, which I hope he does, because I want Cheryl to hear it too, Adam is a, a, a mind turn on for me. Like I love Adam. He's one of he's the smartest so, people I know. He's so brilliant, and I'm so attracted to his, um, his brain, and I love being around him. It's not a sexual thing. It's, a, it's just, he's so interesting, and I'm fascinated with him. And, and I just love to hang with him. So I am attracted to people for who they are and what they give out and like whatever it is. Some people I'm attracted to because they're physically beautiful. Some people I'm attracted to because they're so amazing on the inside that I don't see the outside so much and I see this like amazing radiating goodness. So I'm attracted to a lot of people on a daily basis. But with her, it was like an immediate kind of fun, like, like deviant, wicked, we're not supposed to be doing this kind of thing. And I was okay with it way before she was. She, she, you know, and she said to me, she goes, Sherry, I don't want to be judged. And I was like, you know, I get that. I don't want to be judged either. But if you don't like me for what I do, well, come on, you could be, you could be born again, Christian, Mormon, you could have three wives, you could be whatever you are, I don't know. But you want me to like you for who you are, or despite of what you believe, like we can all like each other and not necessarily agree with it. Like one of my clients is is big in the Mormon church. And not only that, he's on, he's the president of a mission and he happens to own that 
candle warming, that wax warming company we talked about. And he had me over for dinner with his family. And I told him, I was like mortified. Like, how do I tell this Mormon client who controls so much business for me, how do I tell him this? And he was, I didn't want to, but he asked me about my relationship with her. And I was like, okay, here's the deal. And I told him and he looked at me and he said, we love you. We, we adore you. We accept you. We're fine with it. Why didn't you tell us sooner? And I'm like, I just thought you would judge me. And he goes, why do you judge me? And I'm like, well, yeah, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it, we, we should be kinder to each other and more understanding and realize that what's the difference who we love as long as it's legal. Like, what is the difference? There's no difference, right? Just love people. Just that's why that's probably why this whole Black Lives Matter movement is so important to me because I have a lot of black friends and I don't even get racism. I mean, like, yeah, when I was growing up, people said stupid shit. We lived in a Jewish home and there was definitely bigotry going on. But as an adult, I'm like, I love people. If you're a good person, I love you. You know, you're, you're a great person. You can be in my life. I don't care your background, your religion, your sexual orientation, your gender, your I don't care. Just be a good person. You can come hang out with me. We'll make holiday together. So that's kind of the story. Um, and I just, like I said, I don't, when people say, did you, did you march in the pride parade? I'm like, no, because I don't see myself any different than when I was married to a man. I'm still the same Shari. It's just so I have a different partner, but I'm not suddenly part of a new community. I'm still part of my mommy community in Plantation, Florida. I'm still like, just don't have the same partner? Like, what's well, the I'm difference? I'm just not a parade marcher. Um, but yeah. one of the things that I decided, um, you know, certainly at the beginning of this pandemic, one of the things that really occurred to me is that we kind of had a triple pandemic going on. There was the COVID-19 pandemic, there was the pandemic of ignorance, and there was the pandemic of racism. Oh. And I said, okay, how can I use my voice to be part of the solution? And what's my lane? You know, where can I have impact? And with this podcast, I decided I can have impact. And so yeah. what we have been doing is certainly amplifying black voices as far as uh, addressing uh, institutional yeah. and structural uh, racism, yes. um, certainly racial disparities in healthcare. Uh, but I've also tried to use this podcast to be an ally and amplify all kinds of stories of people making choices that were different than when we were in high school. And we, we talked to several women. Uh, we even had one woman come out on the show. Which, oh, I love that. Which was very fun. And I was unexpected. Uh, yeah, that was unexpected. And we just kind of, you know, rolled tape. Uh, yeah. and that's what you do. Uh, I, that's how we talk in the ladies' room. And speaking of talking in the ladies' room, I could talk to you forever, of course. Uh, but what I really want to get to uh, that's not really in your book. So we want scoop here. Okay. Um, I always ask all our guests to tell us their most unique, interesting, different, or memorable experience they ever had in the ladies' room. But since you went on a whole journey, I want to hear about more than one experience. So I want to hear first what was the most interesting, unique, or different uh, ladies' room experience you had on your journey. Um, oh, well, it wasn't actually in a ladies' room. It was <laughs> it was a fake ladies' room. Mm -hmm. um, so here, I was, cl I was camping, glamping, whatever in a tent. To me, camping is sleeping in a four-star hotel with the windows open. You wouldn't like this kind of camping. It was in a tent. It's in the book. I talk about it. And I, you know, I'm a pretty free spirit. You know, I mean, it doesn't have to be a fancy ladies room for me. But um, so I went to the tent and I was following this weird map at night in the dark. I have no sense of direction. I mean, really don't. Like, Honestly, I inherited that from my dad. I get lost going out of my driveway and I don't know which way is east or west. And I got into the tent and I had gone to the ladies room in the restaurant about 50, mi 50 minutes away. And I was like, I'm going to bed, it's in the dark. And I wake up in the morning and I, okay, so just personal stuff. I'm one of those like on the clock. I can, I, I can poop on command. I, I know some people can't do that. Don't brag. I, yeah, no, I, I have never been constipated a day in my life ever. Even even we actually passive. did an episode on somebody who had severe, severe, severe constipation, which literally led to her kishkas coming out. Her kishkas, rectal, well, rectal, rectal, I don't, I, even, even matzo brai will not constipate me. So I wake up in the morning. It's like dark out. I'm in Utah. I'm in the mountains, and I they told me there was a like a some kind of a bathroom near the tent. So I open up. 
it, with my headlight on, which is so ridiculous, I'm looking for the bathroom. Like I'm looking for a real bathroom. Like, who am I kidding? I see a porta potty all the way down the hill. It's dark, it's cold, I'm, there's no way. And I'm like, all right, listen, I'm not gonna be the first one who poops in the woods. It's not a big deal. I take off, I take off my bottoms, I've got the top on and the headlamp and a sweatshirt. And I walk out of the tent and I walk kind of up a hill and I'm like looking around with the headlight, like where's a good spot? Cause I need to hold on to something and I see this big rock. So I walk over to the rock and I'm holding onto the rock and like, I'm like, okay, I can do this. So I'm a little freaked out cause I'm freezing my behind is cold. And, they, and there were wet wipes. I didn't know what the wet wipes were for in the tent, but now I know what they were for. I thought they were COVID, but they weren't. And I go and I'm like, okay, I'm done. And I wipe and I'm whatever. And I stand up and I'm like, so I call it my post poop glory. Cause I'm so <laughs> happy. Like I did this. Like I haven't pooped in the woods since I was a Girl Scout when I was 12. I was so happy. And I'm like, you know, gonna do my little post poop glory walk back to the tent. Only I didn't remember that I had walked uphill to get to Poop Rock, which I call it. Wait, and then I kind of fell down and I'm naked from the waist down and I had wiped myself with a wet wipe. So I'm now in the sandstone with like sandstone in every crevice, gross. And there's no running water. It's not like I can go, all right, I'll just go and wash myself. So I'm like upset. I go back into the tent. I'm wiping myself with the wet wipes and I'm starting to look, you can't say Indian anymore because that's not correct. So indigenous, I'm covered in sandstone that is caked onto my body. I'm like, whatever. I put my clothes back on. I'm going to wait for, for the light to come out outside and then I'll go and find the shower because they told me there's also a shower and all right, I, I get back out of out and I'm with my towel and I'm again marching like down the little road to the shower and I open the door and it's like, not happening. It's one of these like, you know, like it's in the book too, but it's this wood framed, like outhouse looking thing. And I open the door and there's a little shower seat like you get when you have bunion surgery. And there's two bags, like IV bags hanging on the walls with like a hose. And I'm thinking it's 41 degrees out, like sun shower. I think it's more like moon shower. And then I'm going to rinse myself in freezing cold water and like, no. So I go back to my tent, still covered in sandstone. And then I had to make my way into town to visit my friends. Fortunately, they were staying at a hotel because they were smart. And I was able to shower and, and use the facilities. But that was a good ladies room thing. I've never had anything really weird happen. In That's the, the most creative one we've, we've heard. It was creative. I, I've never had anybody, to, you know, oh, oh, someone's telling me a secret. I'm you know, like we actually state. had a sex therapist um, on our uh, podcast, um, Dr. Laura Berman, and she talked about, of course, she went into a lady's room and somebody was having sex in the next stall. Oh, so, I've only did that. On, I've only, oh, sorry, did oh, grammar. I've only done that on the plane. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so you're in the mile high club. Well, you know, sort it's of kind of a requirement <laughs> if you're in the travel industry. But here's the thing, like having sex in a bathroom, ew. I mean, no, no, You have wrong. to be pretty desperate or pretty horny or pretty yeah. young I, I and mean, no other it, options. It's, it's, no, that's, no. I mean, I'll do almost anything once. Where's the know? most unusual place you ever had sex? <laughs> okay, so unusual. Um, so I was married and I was in Vegas and I kind of convinced my husband that we should have sex on the rooftop of some weird building. Like, because you're in Vegas, what's good, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> so yeah, I, that was weird. Um, let me think of weird. weird. I once asked somebody what was the most unusual place they ever had sex and she said in the butt. In the butt, that's a joke, that's a cool <laughs> joke, in the butt. In, it was on Family Feud, in the butt. No, I mean, usual, I don't know, really unusual? I don't know, I'm, a, I'm an anywhere, any girl kind of, any, no, not anywhere, any girl. <laughs> okay, can we put a We have people it? with all kinds of confessions here. Anyway, anywhere, any Shari, I could talk to you forever and ever, um, but I have to plug your book, uh, From Hill to Hala. I want everybody to go to Amazon and write a review and also say there has to be an audio book. We need to have an audio book. Um, and uh, it has been a pleasure, pleasure, pleasure having you here as always. Um, we also have to leave people wanting more so they can read the book. But thank you so, so much for joining us. And everybody, thank you for tuning in and listening. Okay, there's one thing that we have to say at the end of this, which oh, is- what my do we have to say? 
Okay. Can you think? Can you see it? I cannot. Okay. Can you see it now? Uh, what does it say? It says Hallelujah. Hallelujah is her tattoo. So my new thing is hashtag. Her, on her hashtag head. Hallelujah. And if you read the book and you want, just hashtag Hallelujah. Or really, I I'd love to talk to people. So just. Read the book, find me on buyc.net. You can find me from helltohalla.com. Reach out to me, happy to talk to you. And I hope everybody is mentally healthy. Yeah. And we're gonna go on. I love you, Danica Moore. You're I awesome. love you too. And next time you come to New Jersey, you must come here and teach me how to make challah, which I have never made. Oh, oh, oh any day. <laughs> oh, bring it, any day, we're doing it. We're so doing yes. it. Yes, that's a date, especially the chocolate one. That sounds very appealing. You date with me, Danica Moore? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Thank you so much. That's all we have time for today. Let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Janica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Janica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.